Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings and good evening. I think I cut on that a little bit fast tonight. I'm sorry, but uh, here we are. December 29, 2013, and in the news tonight, we turn now to an explosion at a train station in the southern Russian city of Vlogard, Volgograd, that has killed at least 15 people, according to reports. Volgograd's central railway station, and the moment a bomb went off in the entrance hall at lunchtime, instantly killing many of the passengers. Investigators quickly said it was the work of a female suicide bomber who had blown herself up just inside the building, at the exact spot where the metal detectors were, arches which were designed to stop weapons and explosives getting into the building. The Kremlin immediately ordered railway stations and airports to step up security. President Putin told his law enforcement services to do everything that was necessary to keep people safe. Russia is grieving. The immediate concern is for the injured and the relatives of the dead. The new year is the big annual family holiday here. For 16 families today, it became a time of mourning. But Russia is also due to host the Winter Olympics in six weeks' time. The eyes of the world are on the host city Sochi, just 400 miles from Volgograd. And there have always been security worries about staging the Olympics so close to Russia's troubled republics of Chechnya and Dagestan. In June, one of the leaders of the Islamist insurgency there, Doku Umarov, called on his supporters to use maximum force to disrupt what he called the satanic games. I was always saying that um, Umarov's um, warning is quite serious stuff. And yes, I think a lot of people are responding to his clear order to organize more and more things uh, in the area. The Sochi Winter Olympics are seen as a personal prestige project for President Putin, who's done all he can to reassure the International Olympic Committee that the Games will be safe. But Sochi is only 250 miles from Beslan, the scene of a terrible school siege nine years ago that killed more than 300 people, half of them children. And today's explosion was a reminder. You can't guarantee security in southern Russia. And friends talk about explosions. There was another explosion on uh, Friday that killed a uh, former Lebanese minister who uh, was uh, an opposition figure that happened in Beirut. Mr. Shata was a critic of Lebanon's Hezbollah movement. Let me give you his whole name. You'll hear it in this video. It's uh, Mohammed Shata, the former Lebanese minister and opposition figure. He was a critic of uh, Lebanon's Hezbollah movement and was killed by a car bomb on Friday. No one has claimed responsibility for the bombing. The bombing killed six other people and injured at least 50. Paul Adams has this report. A noisy send-off for the latest victims of Lebanon's political violence. Mohammed Shatah and his bodyguard killed two days ago in the heart of Beirut. The former finance minister, a well-known moderate, trying to keep Lebanon out of the conflict in neighboring Syria, seen by some as a future prime minister. We are here just to support uh, Mohammed Shatah, who was a great man, a potential prime minister, a technocrat, and he was killed because the terrorists who are, who are fighting technocrats and the government are technocrats. Uh, he, that's why he, he was killed, and it's, it's, a, not, it's, it's a big loss for the country. Mr. Shatah's supporters have been quick to blame the Shiite movement Hezbollah and its Syrian backers. 
The group has denied the claim, calling the assassination a horrible crime. But as its opponents bury one of their own, there are fresh calls to confront Hezbollah. We have decided to march with the peaceful people of Lebanon towards a peaceful, civic and democratic resistance. We have decided to liberate our country from the occupation of arms. The car bomb that killed Mohammed Shatah was hardly unique. Beirut has seen more than its share of similar outrages in the past. But his death adds to the ominous sense that Syria's civil war is placing ever greater strain on Lebanon's fragile political system. Paul Adams, BBC News. And, friends, more on that. Let me roll a video in the background. I think this video simply has raw footage, no commentary to it, of the funeral procession for Mr. Smith. Uh, I don't pronounce his name now, but his first name. Um, Shata. Well, I can't find my notes on the screen now. But in this uh, next report, uh, Lebanon, uh, Saudi Arabia is to give Lebanon's army a grant of $3 billion. Now, the equivalence of that, for those listening in the UK, that'd be 1.8 billion British pounds sterlings. For those of you in the rest of Europe, that is. 2.8 billion euros, euros and dollars running almost neck and neck, but the euro worth a little more than the dollar, you know, euro per dollar. Uh, the Lebanese president, Michel Sliman, made the announcement of this grant, this $3 billion grant, in a televised address after this funeral of, of uh, Mr. Shatab. From who was killed again in that uh, car bomb attack on Friday. Uh, the president of Saudi Arabia said this grant would help fight terrorism. Mohammed Shatta was a staunch critic, who, by the way, he was a uh, Sunni Muslim, and he was a staunch critic of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and Lebanon's uh, Shia Hezbollah movement that backs him. Saudi Arabia said Hezbollah have taken opposite sides. Well, who in Hezbollah? Let's see. Saudi and Hezbollah have taken opposite sides in the Syrian conflict. The king of the brotherly kingdom of Saudi Arabia is offering this generous and appreciated aid of $3 billion to the, to the Lebanese army to strengthen its capabilities, Mr. Sliman said in his address. He said it was the largest assistance provided in Lebanon's history and would be used to buy weapons from France. Brother Reuben in the act. And the president of Reuben, the French president, Francois Hollande, said his country would meet any demands for weapons from Lebanon during a visit on Sunday to Saudi Arabia aimed at boosting commercial ties with the kingdom. Oh, how money talks. <laughs> I'm in touch with President Sliman, the president of France said. If demands are made to us, we will meet them, he said. President Sliman said the Saudi aid would finally allow the Lebanese army to confront terrorism and put an end to the proliferation of arms. How many times have we heard talk like that before, friends? Peace, peace. And, ne you know, we are, Arthur Neville Chamberlain comes back from his visit to Germany after he's sat down and talked face to face with Adolf Hitler, comes back and tells all of England, I'm, don't worry, we've made a peace treaty with Germany. We, England and Germany, oh, you know, we're like this. Peace, peace, don't worry. <laughs> Go the bombs soon thereafter, night after night, over London. Did Mr. 
Chamberlain go back to Germany and sit down with Hitler and say, hey, you broke your word, you promised. Mm -mm, not after those bombs started dropping, baby. He didn't go anywhere near Germany. <laughs> Except to have the British Royal Air, For uh, Royal Air Force go over with their bombs eventually after it took them months to get their act together to put up any kind of defense. They had to turn their lights out in London for a long time, totally black it out with no defenses against these German, the German aircraft flying over, dropping bombs. And then they got themselves an air force together quickly, finally. And then after 1941, December 7, Pearl Harbor, uh, is it December 21 or December 7? One or the other. Uh, my brain a little foggy tonight. I've just been getting over a certain illness resulting from a broken tooth. And by the way, again, thank you, everybody who prayed. I'm doing fine. But uh, I don't have any more video on, on this, but I do have a note on this story about Saudi Arabia, Arabia giving this $3 billion to the Lebanese army. It's a grant. It's not a loan. It won't become a deficit or a debt for the country of Lebanon. It's a grant from Saudi Arabia. The BBC's Arab Affairs editor, Sebastian Usher, said the president indirectly touched on a dangerous taboo in Lebanon, the unchecked power of the Shia movement. Hezbollah. That issue is coming to the boil due to a conflict in neighboring Syria where Hezbollah is fighting on the side of President Assad. So says the BBC correspondent. The Saudis back the other side, the mostly Sunni rebels. The kingdom also supports the pro-Western March 14 alliance in Lebanon, of which Mohammed uh, Shatta was a leading member. So, boy, the, the uh, diversity of factions there, the con potential for uh, confusion and strife. Lebanon has been hit by a wave of attacks linked t to heightened Sunni Shia tensions over the Syria war. Mr. Shatta was buried on Saturday amid tight security. The former Lebanese minister and opposition figure was, again, he was killed by a car bomb. You know, I'm going to back up that again and let you just see that funeral procession up close while I finish this up. Uh, that car bomb that killed Mr. Shatta also killed six other people, and I, I believe I mentioned this earlier, it also injured at least 50. No one has claimed responsibility for the bombing, but Mr. Hirari implicitly accused Hezbollah of carrying it out. Hezbollah rejected the accusation calling the bombing a heinous crime which comes in the context of a series of crimes and explosions aimed at uh, sabotaging the country. Syria also denied any involvement in the attack. More explosions and more uh, of this type of thing in the, the Bangladesh election protest sparks Daki clashes. Clashes began as soon as opposition supporters tried to march on the streets of the capital. At the gates of the Supreme Court, police used water cannons. In other places, as opposition activists threw stones, police fired rubber bullets and tear gas. The National Press Club turned into a battle zone. No one was allowed near the opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party offices. Government has totally occupied our main headquarter, the party office at Nyapalton, not an ant is allowed to walk in front of the office, not to speak of any party activists. They have totally captivated our leader of the opposition, 
she is not allowed to move, she is not allowed to get into her car, she is not allowed to come out of her house. Behind several layers of security barricades is the residence of the leader of the opposition, Khalida Zia. She has been holed up here for uh, more than a day. She hasn't come out yet to attend the mass protest rally. She said she will be attending several kilometers away from here on the other side of town. She has called for her opposition activists to gather from all over the country in what she has called a march for democracy. When Ms. Zia finally tried to step out of her house, police prevented her from leaving. Hundreds have been detained since the new anti-government movement was announced last week. In the last few days, the arrest, the uh, anticipatory arrest that uh, those have been made, I think that's because of uh, the kind of uh, violence that people were anticipating. The whole country, if their protest was supposed to be so peaceful, then why is there so much apprehension? Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is determined to hold general elections next week despite the opposition boycott. On Sunday, the government's resolve to stop anyone from derailing those polls was clear on the streets of Dhaka. Scores have been killed in political violence this year. The remaining days, or even the new year, is not looking any better. Mahfuz Sadiq, BBC News, Dhaka. And friends, in the Ukraine, which we're keeping an eye on because of the potential impact that it has to what's going on in Europe. You know, it has some. Now, we're also watching Romania and uh, well, the other country over there that now is able, as of January 1, I say as of now, in just a few days from now, will be able, their citizens will be able to enter the UK and s seek employment there as part of a EU uh, agreement. And there's been con some concerns whether how, how whether the UK would wind up with a lot of people on unemployment because of that, but there's a three-month bar before people of Romania can go on unemployment. So, and during those three months, they're supposed to be looking for work. But uh, there are going to be a lot of more, a lot more citizens from Romania now in side of uh, and Bulgaria. That's the other country that I'm keeping an eye on. And uh, you know, I'm going to just talk openly for a moment, friends. Uh, I haven't been able to find the exact quote or, or writing, but I remember so vividly Mr. Armstrong pointing out that when Romania and Bulgaria were able to enter the, as he put it at the time, the European common market, and with the idea that eventually all of that would narrow down to five countries from the east, five from the west, and be called, or at least be something like a United States of Europe, a real a federation of five countries from the west, five from the east, countries that are described in prophecy like uh, clay and iron, miry clay and iron, which don't mix, meaning in other words, they, they don't get along normally, but for a short time, <coughs> something will happen that will cause them to, you know, come together and unite and give the power of the five and the five to one leader, most likely one new Assyrian emperor, most likely crowned right in the coronation city of Frankfurt, Germany, which is now the home of the ECB, the European Central Bank. I just put it together, friends, you know, the empire that was always reigned and ruled, not always, but for the most part, even the Frankish kingdom, kings were, many of them coronated right there in Frankfurt when it was to be a king, an emperor over the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire with the Roman Catholic Church associated and affiliated with it. And this next time that 
the Roman Empire comes out of the pit, as it did for a brief while during around the time of World War II with Mussolini and his invasion into Ethiopia and his proclamation that this is the Roman Empire. And indeed it was a temporary, momentary, uh, moment in time revision, an uprising, a rising up again of the Roman Empire to be the sixth uh, head uh, of what's going to be seven heads, and the seventh head is yet to come. Um, the sixth head was during the time of Mr. Herbert Armstrong, and Mr. Armstrong was able to see that that prophecy was written for his time because it says, one is, and the one that is was the sixth head during the time Mr. Armstrong was alive and broadcasting. And that prophecy was for his moment in time. You know, friends, God gave Mr. Herbert Armstrong an extremely unique position in these latter days that he caused Daniel to foresee in dreams, and yet Daniel couldn't put it all together and understand it because God kept it closed up and sealed what it all would mean until the, time, the latter days, until the time of the end, until knowledge would be increased and people would be able to go to and fro. Daniel, oh, how he longed to know what's been put on a silver platter for us. You know, friends, I was talking to somebody the other day and thinking out loud and commenting that, you know, it's kind of like being given the gift of a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. Now when my dad used to give those to me, my dad loved those things. Maybe someday you know I, friends, I went to a funeral the other day of a long, long time church member. And that funeral was held in the uh, funeral home where my dad had his funeral and where he is now buried. And at my dad's funeral, you know, fresh after death, even though I mourned out loud and like crazy within minutes, After my dad died on Pentecost Day in 2008, you know, to me at that moment, it was the last time in the world I thought God would allow my dad to die on Pentecost Sunday that year. And so it took me an extreme shock. I had just laid down to get three hours of sleep after having been up for 48 solid hours with my dad at the hospital, up with him all night as the nurse would come in and clean him up every few minutes, and I would help. And uh, so I was up all night with my dad for, for 48 hours. And so I'm getting three hours sleep. I think my dad's, you know, going to be okay through the day, even though the doctors had said he only had so long to live. I didn't believe God would let him die that day. And I, I mourned and I cried out that morning and I went and got on my knees and With an extremely broken heart, I asked God, I said, God, how come you let my dad die on a holy day? And you know, friends, it was instant. I mean, it was in within moments. And, and frankly, I was in a mourning, very, I guess you would call it, negative state of mind. And yet, boom, here comes this extremely positive thought in response to my prayer. And I have seen it as if it, the only thing it could be. God put an answer into my head from him immediately to comfort me and say, Steve, I know you loved your dad and enjoyed being with him in the way you were able to be with him in his last 
few years. <clears throat> but God put, followed that with the thoughts that I'm freeing you up so that I can use you for something and not have you burdened. And you know, when I look back, uh, my days were consumed with pretty much whatever <laughs> whatever my dad wanted to do. That was my day. It went three times a week. We'd go to the Y together, work out, go to the water aerobics class, which my dad loved. And I, I enjoyed that with my dad. Now, I, I don't do it now because I find demands on my time say I really can't afford that time. But when my dad was alive and I had dedicated myself to being his caregiver and helper and right hand, we did that three days a week, you know, and and so, uh, friends, let's we'll see. I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. Something threw me off. Um, I was thinking of that funeral of the brother, but i tell you one thing I'm very thankful for. If some of you are watching now, I'm very excited about some of you I have just heard from in uh, the email, especially from Kansas City. I'm looking forward. I couldn't answer your email right away because I had to get tonight's program to together and I had unbelievable number of interruptions throughout the day today and it was almost like I had this enemy fighting me to be able to try to get to today's program together. I kept having to fight for the time to get back at it and there were cer certain things screaming at me for attention. And uh, But anyway, we got it done and um, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to some new brethren I've never known before who have stayed faithful. And... Um, I've got one more story, and we got to close this up, friends. So I'm going to look forward to I'm going to be talking with some of you, and I'm excited about that. Uh, this last story, tens of thousands of Ukrainians have gathered in Kiev. I was just trying to tell you, though, we're watching Romania and Bulgaria because Mr. Armstrong warned us that when they started coming together to get inside of this United States of Europe, inside of the uh the EEC, now the EU, that's going to grow into the United States of America, whatever they will call it, and that's been in some late news in that term, ver ver verbiage even, that Mr. Armstrong used to use. But he told us, when they come in there, watch out. It's going to all fall together quick. That's what he told us. I wish somebody out there could find his words for me on that. But I remember it, friends, and it made an indelible mark in my mind and that tells me I don't care even if it looks like things are slowing down we were told it's going to come together spin together quick after Bulgaria and Romania get inside that EU thing and they're officially getting into it as of January 1 in a very unique way now uh, Ukraine is associated with uh, the EU, it's on the border with Russia, and half of its citizens or more want to go with the an, a, an association and a tie-in with the EU. Another half of them, especially those close to the border of Russia, who people there, citizens of the Ukraine, who speak the Russian language and do a lot of business with Russia. Whole cities, sometimes municipalities, being funded by sales to Russia. So they like the tie with Russia. It's just about split the country in half. And so, uh, you know, that can have some impact on what happens with the coming together of the EU. EU. So we watch that. And tens of thousands of Ukrainians have gathered in Kiev in, in fresh, brand new anti-government protest. I'm just going to tell you about it because we're out of time. I don't have time to show you the video tonight, but here's the point of the video. Demonstrators also marched on President Viktor Yanukovych's official residence outside the capital, demanding he resigned. A bunch of them got in their cars, drove over to his uh, to his residence. You know, and it's a funny story in a way. I'll try to play it tomorrow night. Got to say so long for tonight. Thanks for joining me, folks. Uh, God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again Monday evening for the next edition of Nightcast news related to the Bible and prophecy. Until next time, your host Stephen Lloyd Gilbert saying, So long, friends. 
You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive. <laughs>